the reality is, is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, if you are too much in advance of your time, you are misunderstood. That's one possibility. The other one is that uh, you don't get uh, just uh, any uh, recognize, recognizement uh, to, for, for your work because nobody is able to understand what you're saying. It's usual. Uh, but uh, it, there is a social explanation for that because the system has to be, uh, uh, has to grow in a reliable way. So, be, before uh, jumping from one paradigm to a new one, it's like to be sure to leave a an house and uh, uh, having a new house to inhabit mm -hmm. uh, in a reliable way. So I think that uh, I, I, is, is a, a issue that uh, I discussed yesterday with Gary mm -hmm. too, that uh, uh, again, it's a, a individual social relationship. Again, if you promote a new idea by yourself, uh, you, you have to invest in uh, a social, uh, um, uh, let's say, a, a weakness for this new idea and try to convince them that this new idea is more convenient than the past one. And so when you gather a, a few people that just share your thinking, then the, the system is ready to jump. But that's the way we, and I take this opportunity to make it just a strong connection with what you said, with what I will say this afternoon, uh, it's a matter of objective subject, subjective relationship. Again, individual, social, subjective, objective. It's in this relationship that anything can grow. And so we have to understand that there is no way to study systems in a separate way any longer. If you study the individual, you lose. If you study the social, you lose. You have to study the interrelationship between uh, individual and, and, and social environment. That's the important thing, according to my little experience uh, right now. Be, uh, because uh, um, I tried many times to promote new ideas in my, my establishment and they were rejected because uh, nobody understood that. Uh, till now, uh, right now, uh, I, I try to promote a new understanding and they just say, oh, okay, go to the mathematician because uh, we are interested in, in different ways, in, in, diff in different things. And that's, that's not the case because, uh, you know, uh, everything is connected and uh, a, 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 the important thing is to have a, a transdisciplinary review and a, a trans-contextual understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, I think, that uh, Boscovich tried to promote at that time, to, unfortunately, too much in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, yes, I, I fully agree with him. And, and... I also look into the reason why Boschkovic was somehow forgotten, and I think it has probably to do with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Boschkovic has a very profound understanding maybe of reality, but it has no concrete application. In, in fact, if you look at Newton, New, Boschkovic is actually criticizing Newton. Newton is has a lot of conceptual and contradiction in his system, Absolutely. and we recognize the one that already Boscovich knew that, well, if you have only attraction, uh, everything would be mm -hmm. squeezed in one collapse in one reality. But what Newton had with his three laws, he had very strong instrument by which you could apply your piece of knowledge, even if it was not really perfect, into concrete uh, action. And so even today, sending a, a satellite in orbit, we are still using U, uh, Newton's uh, theory, uh, uh, three laws of movement. And so he had a very tremendous power of, for applicability of the knowledge. Boscovich somehow, we don't know very much. He, he actually is, he, he was a, an engineer also, but he, he is the one who is responsible for repairing the cracks of the St. Peter. He also did a lot of uh, water work in Livorno and in, in Rome, so he was, he had a, a, the mind of an engineer, it was just in the sky, and he also made a lot of instruments, and so 
but this theory it seems to have abandoned it in a way. Some some people say we should have branched out into electricity, uh, but knew about electricity, but kind of didn't go that far. Very interesting, man. and uh, to use myself as a subject. Then, uh, for example, I had uh, some difficulty to visualize uh, your triangles, uh, and uh, uh, I'm a more visual person. Uh, you know, an image would have said more than many words, and this is about creativity. So my question is, uh, uh, from the life of Boscovich uh, and others, uh, I was very impressed that you mentioned so many aspects that which uh, I think uh, you were talking about, uh, like Zen Buddhism uh, and, and Satori, about uh, a bio-psycho-social vision uh, of uh, creativity and discovery, and then I would uh, add, uh, would it be true also for innovation? Uh, now, in my opinion, like for example, I was lucky enough uh, to arrive in '68 and live uh, in Berkeley, California, and you know I was uh, studying psychology, but actually I was a pupil of Alan Watts, uh, an English professor that was teaching in houseboat in Sassolito. Zen and Buddhism. And I remember very well this kind of a straight, rigid guy that was talking about a totally fascinating concept of Zen Buddhism, which to get out of the box, and then re entering the box because he was, and I said, why? Doing a tea ceremony, a Zen Buddhist ceremony, which is a very rigid ritual. But inside that uh, constricted box of ritual, that uh, free flowing elegance. So, my question is since uh, the bio we know from the mystics, uh, fasting, uh, chanting, uh, dancing, the Sufi, and then uh, uh, in every culture, drugs, hallucinogenic drugs, then uh, in terms uh, of psychological, uh, well, I guess that, that the creativity flourish uh, where there is a, a ferment, a ground to really toss and exchange idea. Renaissance uh, Florence, uh, for example, <laughs> the Bay Area in the 60s, and where also there is money, money to uh, invest uh, in something that uh, might not work or not, but like uh, the magnitude and the measurement uh, of uh, the uh, in Florentine era. Uh, so, uh, why uh, also the opposite is true? People that live under dictatorship, uh, people that are in jail, right? Grunchy, great books, uh, come up uh, with great idea. But Kooning uh, wrote in his mind that uh, it took uh, because he was trapped, uh, standing up uh, for years, three years in jail with his hands uh, and uh, legs tied up uh, straight to the wall. He came out and wrote uh, what he had written in his head. Uh, so, uh, there is a way, taking also the example of Oskovich, uh, that uh, we can say, that uh, we have some variable that uh, would uh, promote creativity and, for example, democracy and free circulation idea, university where there is free data, research center, country that invite like the United States and give that uh, scholarship uh, to brilliant uh, foreign students and then uh, there, you know, a lot of Italian goes to Berkeley <laughs> labs uh, to invent the things that, that are copyrighted in the United States and Italy has to buy because Italy is not so intelligent as to promote the creativity so on ground and so forth. So there is a recipe, so to speak, some variable that would say that we plan to foster creativity in children, in a kindergarten, school, university, and also in society, because a more creative society is, in my opinion, a more democratic and more prosperous society. Uh, this is here where 
uh, again, uh, Lee Smalling is interesting. I hope he, he is going to take on his project more. He, he, he looked into the personality of the researchers. Uh, so he said, well, Einstein is more like uh, someone who had uh, uh, a philosopher and has a wide culture mm -hmm. and so forth, whereas uh, others would be more specific and more engineering-minded. Uh, then we can look at Boschkovich and try to understand his Jesuit education and, and see what the Jesuit were doing and how much uh, they were actually creating the basis of uh, what became creativity and adaptability. I mean, for us, the Jesuits, uh, I have a lot of respect for them because when they came to Quebec, I mean, they were, they had nothing. They were the one who would go first. Uh, they were, and if you think of South America also, I know there are bad things, but think of the good things. These guys willing to first uh, face adversity. And so, um, then, if you look at the, the Jesuit education and you look at the Zen education too, there's something that is being forgotten here in the West is that uh, even those practicing yoga, there is a, a first stage of very strict way of life, the diet, how you behave, what you should do, and those, this creates what seems to be a very, uh, I would say, narrow-minded way of living becomes the basis for creativity. And when you go the other way around, when you start at the basis and you be very open and so forth, you don't have any creativity. You have almost stupidity. They, they don't know what to do. They just repeat the same bad things. But to create creativity, to have creativity, is you have to have uh, the basis of what we learn, like the métier in French, we say it's like uh, the trade. So you think of musician, you think of martial arts, you think of all these repetition they have to wait to assimilate the the technique so that they can move on from the technique and be creative with those techniques so it's how can you be how can you be creative if you don't know to play piano when I mean, you have to go through the learning the scales and learning the etude and so forth then after that you can move on into creativity so this is the important and, and i see the jesuit education was very strict but if we go further then into this, it has a disadvantage. And Bolshevich had a problem with his, co uh, his colleagues that they didn't want to uh, they didn't want to change so much. They wanted to keep the old system. And this is here the duality between the two. In order to create a firm basis for, uh, let's say, to, to have character uh, development, you need to fix things. And you cannot play around once you fix it. So even so, the parasitic system, the old system, was part of the firm education. Now, if you start playing around with this, you also put into geo, uh, geopardy the, 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 the type of education that was used for character building. And so Bostovich was one of the, who had the benefit of the character building education, but also he lived with people that was this 18th century that were exploring ideas and so forth. So he was somehow torn between his own education and what the Jesuit also wanted to do. So in a way, to some extent, I think it's, it's a contradict, not a contradiction, but a, a duality within the order of the Jesuits. They want to be up to date, they want to be so, they want to be, uh, not to be uh, in terms of science, in terms of ideas, in terms of art, they just don't want to be backward, they want to be at the, uh, the forefront of society, but at the same time, their education has to do to be based on very conservative principles, so this is a, a tension. So well, I think both of us kind of represent this tension within its own community. First of all, that I was uh, stunned by the breadth in depth of the presentation. I was particularly pleased at the effort to uh, uh, connect uh, Western ideas of science and scientific achievement with the achievement that comes out of the Eastern mystical traditions, in particular the uh, elements of character building, uh, meditation, and deep introspective um, um, uh, thought. Uh, in all candor, I was surprised. I, I expected 
Roscovich to be much more conventionally scientific than, than the eclectic uh, introduction that we got today. Uh, and indeed, uh, I initially prepared by putting together a sort of cookbook on how to encourage creative thinking. <laughs> and it's, it seems a bit uh, modest compared to what uh, we received today. Um, so I won't go through that cookbook, but I can mail it to anyone who wants to see it. Um, let me just start with some thoughts that uh, come to me. First of all, I am not a physicist. I do have a degree, and many of you will laugh at the uh, characterization of the degree. My degree is a doctor of juridical science, and people will think that juridical and science are just not compatible ideas. Uh, but uh, my the, the form of the doctor that emerged in the early part of the 20th century uh, was highly influenced by science and analogies to science. And so, in a sense, Yale, for example, really wanted to create a curriculum of legal development that was based on scientific principles. But those scientific principles were disputed at that time and are intensely disputed today. So, with that, I should say that when I went to Yale, I, uh, I had been trained uh, in the Oxford Law School, which is one of the most rigorous from the standpoint of using the methods of analytical positives. So I was trained in an extremely conventional and very logically formulated discipline of the law. When I went to Yale, I uh, found that almost everything I said to my advisors, Harold Laswell, who was a president of the academy, Miles McDougall, a fellow, and others, they broke down everything I said. And then one day, in frustration, I said, but you are destroying the very process of conceptualization that I function with. And Laswell smiled and he said, that's exactly what we've been trying to do for the past three weeks, and you finally caught it. <laughs> So, so, so essentially, uh, what Laswell and his colleagues were bringing to law was what they thought was essentially a new paradigm, a new paradigm of legal thinking. Now, why was this new paradigm important? Well, because when their ideas came to fruition, humanity was confronted with a life or death struggle about what the public order of the world community looked like. Were we going to be under the under the uh, repression of Nazism and fascism, or are we going to prevail with a more democratic uh, and open uh, framework of, uh, of public order for the world community? And their commitment was to the public order of the world community that was democratic, that was person-oriented, and human rights direct. So, so, so you could see here there was a change, but, but the conventional view of law was that law is neutral. Neutral as to values, neutral as to these questions of public order. When when law uh, generates a result, it's dictated by logic, not by choice. And so those issues still permeate uh, the culture of law today and the culture of its conceptualization to some extent. Now, <clears throat> uh, what I discovered in my, uh, shall we say, uh, loosening up of the boundaries of the of the logical paradigm was that I did actually read into uh, physics, and particularly quantum physics, and I found some startling uh, uh, notions in quantum physics. For example, the problem of causality is a major problem in quantum physics, mainly because you can't explain the causal connection between the way atoms be uh, electrons behave. And that means that you have to have some other way of explaining what happens in, in the quantum world if you are to make sense of that world. <clears throat> Second, and very uh, significantly analogous to law as well, is the idea of the quantum physicists that we live in a participatory universe. We start out with the notion of an observer, but the observer cannot uh, establish a rigid line of demarcation between observation and participation. In other words, the observer observes 
microparticles and the observer's observation of the microparticles influences the way they behave. Well, in law, we have roughly the same thing. We have observers, we observe the legal phenomenon, and then we spew it out. But what happens is we spew it out and influence the way in which we think the law should behave, so the observer is actually a participator as well. Although the line between how we clearly separate these is not its a fluid line, uh, nonetheless, that's there. And if that's the case, if, the, if we live in a participatory universe from the point of view of law or physics, then the question is, how can we make the level of participation more responsible, at least from the lawyer point of view? We're interested in the defense of the public order, the defense of a defensible public order. Sort of thing. And that is a great challenge for us. Now, we can approach this problem in a multitude of ways. And one of those would be more uh, contemplation, more deep thinking, more deep meditation, uh, uh, to open up some avenues of creativity. And, and creativity remains a major challenge for all law, whether it's from the European Union or from the Supreme Court of the United States. Many, many judges, for example, have pointed out that they've listened to cases they listen to expert lawyers arguing both sides of the case so compellingly that they don't know what the answer is. And one of the most famous judges in our country said, well, you know, I was having a shave. And as I pulled the razor down and got to my chin, a spark appeared. And I understood, oh, the plaintiff is one here, or the defendant is one. But, but he gets an intuition. Another judge was much more explicit. He says, I decide case, case ultimately on hunch. Well, that is still a problem because no lawyer wants to admit that the judge decided the case on hunch or some intuitive assessment that can't be uh, objectively verified or sustained. Nonetheless, that has remained a challenge in law and a challenge in legal thinking, which has given rise to the emergence of what uh, our former president called configurative thinking. And he, he arrived at configurative thinking. I hope I have some time left just to spell this out. Uh, he started out with an epistemology that was radically, um, uh, radically skeptical. Uh, starting out with the notion that if you observe uh, 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 a quantum of, of uh, material, uh, uh, what you will realize is that that quantum material is, is in movement. And so you, you see it, but it's already into the future before you can digest what, what the forces were that impelled it into motion. Um, this problem of the movement of the phenomenal world uh, mm -hmm. is explained perhaps better by the philosopher Whitehead who said, well, we don't want to look at particles, we want to look at events. And events exist on a time-space manifold. And so what you're trying to observe is the event as it's moving from the past, actualizing in the present, and moving into the future. Uh, but this is a very difficult exercise, and as Laswell pointed out, uh, you can't imagine all the factors that would impact causally upon the movement of that event. There are just too many of them. And therefore, your ability to predict is extremely limited. Your ability to verify is even more limited. And he basically pointed out that when we observe with this skeptical view, what we really see is that what we call the stable is really a special case of the unstable. That was his insight. Now. Now, he gave this more thoughts, and a few years later, he, he, he realized that this medical skepticism ends up with us not knowing anything. Um, and so he, he, he then looked at the idea, and he said, well, when we look at this movement of particles, we have to construct a, a configuration and try to locate events in this larger matrix, this larger configuration, if you like, the first elements of holistic thinking. So what we are trying to do is to take the particular and see it in the context of the whole. And, and then the question is, of course, but, but how do you make sense out of this? And he said, well, there's only one way to make sense out of this, 
and that is you have to cultivate the idea of creative orientation. Only by an act of creative orientation you begin to understand the place of the event in the larger manifold of events. Now, <clears throat> the, the critical question is, well, what does he mean by creative orientation? And many people have different ways to put this, but some people say, well, what he means is we have to develop principles of interpretation. Years later, he revisited the problem, and this time changed the focus. Events became problems. <coughs> problems emerged from the, the, the context, the larger configuration. And, 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 and problems uh, 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 implicate values. So if you were trying to describe society, you'd have to grapple with the problems of what values are at stake, what values are implicated in the problems that emerge from the social media. So from the values, we get the idea that one of the ways of problem solving is that we have to engage in normative thinking. Normative thinking is a very special class of thinking, as most philosophers know. But then, what about the normative thinking? Well, they take place in a historical context. So you would have to understand uh, the place of values and value interaction in terms of the historical trend. Trend thinking, historical thinking, is another system of thought. And then, why is the trend a trend? Well, that's scientific thinking thinking in terms of factors and conditions. And that would require us to bring scientific thinking to bear on the issue of problem solving. And we come to the fourth category of thinking, projective thinking. Well, if you're going to solve a problem, it projects into the future. So you have to have some idea of how you can develop a disciplined approach to projecting uh, the solution to the problem into the future, we could call this developmental thinking or projective thinking. In other words, without any human intervention, what's the result? Probable result. And finally, we come to the issue that moves us today, and that is uh, given that without human intervention, we might have a certain consequence, what would the most desirable consequence be from the standpoint of the values at stake? And, and that uh, last was so as uh, the element of alternative or creative thinking. And he believed that you could cultivate the faculty of creative thinking. But from his perspective, he saw this as the utilization of Freudian analysis is called free fantasy. Get the problem, sleep on it, let your mind wander. The next day, somehow or other, have a a creative solution to the church. So what, what configurative thinking from our academy emerged with were these five uh, ways of thinking that had to be integrated into the larger aspect of decision making to solve the problems to improve the human prospect. So, so to the extent that I can bring some element of the integration of these different thoughts, I should add very briefly that that's what himself was very, very uh, deeply interested in Hindu philosophy, uh, in ideas of science that came from Hindu philosophy, in holistic thinking, and, uh, <clears throat> and but he wanted to make sure that holistic thinking was also particularized. So if you like, we are confronted with a epistemological problem of particularity and wholeness, and our job is to basically make sense of it.